I started actually uh, exploring what it is that drones, as we call them now, are good for. Um, and they're good for aerial surveillance, but uh, that doesn't answer the question of what aerial surveillance is good for. Um, so I, um, I'm here to talk about war. And war is so sucky, it's really hard to talk about. It's so bad, and it's so um, uh, difficult that I've spent my career avoiding war technology, right? At Stanford Engineering, I specifically didn't work on anything that had military applications. Why would I? And in fact, I was actually very gender typical in this way. And that's something that's come up um, uh, that, um, you know, when I was there, there was a, um, some funding to study why there was this attrition rate of women and minorities in this pipeline of engineering and technical fields. The pipeline being not just getting people interested, but actually they hemorrhage all the way along. Undergraduates, graduate students, um, women and minorities leave these technical fields. And I began to see it, having listened to all these exiting interviews, like when people leave a technical field, why? They say things like, I want to help people, right? That it was actually this idea of actually re rethinking it as a problem, but as a massive social protest. That, you know, these atypical engineers were in fact moving away from technologies that could be applied in war, um, war tech. So what I, um, um, I'd really, want to tell you my ex is, and it's a, it's a difficult one for me, is, um, is changing war. Uh, and so there's only three things I want to say about it. Uh, firstly, that war is defined by the technologies. The 20th century war uh, you know, is defined by the nuclear um, threat. And a strange thing about it, the iron rule of reciprocity, it worked in some way. It was so bad, it was so lethal that um, it worked. Um, so war is defined by, um, uh, by technology. Secondly, that um, this is a new idea that if it's defined by technology, then technologists might be able to do something about it, redesign that technology. And so the uh, second thing really is, could we change war? Could we make it reversible? Could we make it less bad? Could we make it not evil, right? Um, and uh, and this is a you know we've done we've designed things to be lethal. More does it make sense to make things more and more lethal, right? Dead is dead. It's irreversible, right? It doesn't. It's not even interesting to make something more lethal. So to come back and think about what it is that we could do with our war, this war, the war that we're involved in, whether or not we like. And you know, I would much prefer not to be involved at all, to pretend it's not happening. And I think that's what I've been doing for the last um, you know, few years. So this idea that we could kind of change war to be reversible, we could change that by redesigning the technologies involved. And so the third thing is, of course, that this war is defined by uh, targeted killing, largely by um, drones, the 12,000 aerial unmanned systems, or 8,000 um, ground-based uh, systems that are currently out there. So, um, so that's what I'm actually going to talk about. And I couldn't have asked for a better setup than Wail. Thank you very much. Um, I, um, uh, I'd like to start by thinking about that the, um, what the killer app for drones might be is actually um, not killing. Um, so I'm just going to skip through some of this uh, because I think we had a better setup. Um, what we've done with, uh, with if we arrange um, our sort of technologies, our war tech, into a spectrum from harm of, of force, right, uh, where I'm, sort of the negative aspect we've got, um, we've got harm. You know, and on the you know on going into positive, we've got force used as action as constructive, right? We'd have to agree, and actually, about sixty percent of Americans we're the only country in the world that has a majority that's in favour of drones. Um, in fact, um, that uh, even in um, 
uh, Af even if in Pakistan, I think the, if from the Pew, uh, recent Pew uh, survey, um, it, it used to be 18% in favor of drones. Um, and now there's less than 12%. <laughs> anyway, drones are, you know, are, are better than nuclear warheads, right? They're more targeted. And I think why we like them is because, of course, it means we're not sending our brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and daughters and sons to die. And this strategy of targeted killing that we've uh, unwillingly signed on to is problematic, but it is somehow more palatable than anonymous kids killing anonymous kids, right? There's something a little bit better. So it comes up along the, the spectrum of, of harm to something, uh, uh, you know, a little bit better. But I think we can keep going along that spectrum towards, um, towards populating this quadrant, which is um, towards constructive drones, reprogramming, reimagining our drones to do something else to be something different. Uh, I just want to show you actually this uh, project. Um, this is a um, technology designed by my son when he was five years old. And he was running around the room um, banging at his friend. They were banging at each other. I said, are you shooting each other? And he said, no, no. This is a bullet bouncer backerer, he said, of his imagine, imaginary gun. And um, actually, it turns out that the BBB gun, the bullet bouncing back gun, it's a really interesting idea. It's the taking that mutually assured destruction of nuclear warheads to a micro scale, right? Um, with, a, with some fancy DSP, you have a drone that can only shoot back, right? It can't shoot. It can only identify where a bullet came from, triangulate, and shoot back. That's a, that's a different sort of weapon. Um, and the BBB gun, uh, is a functionality that I think is interesting. You can imagine if that kind of technology comes home, as all war tech does, you know, what is a civilian p police force that's only equipped with guns that can't shoot but can only shoot back, right? It's an interesting, an interesting idea. Um, so um, I think as we move out of technologies, drones for killing into drones to uh, populate that other quadrant, uh, we start to think about um, drones, let's call them robots, um, technologies of engagement and technologies of participation. So I just want to give a couple of little examples that I think uh, I tr illustrated a little bit um, uh, in here. You can start to see that, actually, I think the prescription was written by Whale. Um, you know, we could use drones to establish ad hoc networks, right? They're physical, they're small, they're distributed. They can't do heavy engineering work. They can't do the traditional nation building, bridge building, uh, heavy engineering work that the military has actually claimed to be doing. They can do something very different. Um, so we can start to imagine uh, a few other types of technologies that we can use. I want to show you a couple of examples of um, uh, this kind of exploring a different um, space that I have learned from myself. This is an old project called Feral Robots, where we took the phenomena of entertainment robots that came, kind of landed down amongst us um, as toys, these inexpensive robotic dog platforms, and um, upgraded their raison d'etre, added, uh, gave them rhinoplasty, gave them a new nose, uh, amputated their legs gently, uh, very gently, you know, lowered their um, center of gravity, widened their wheelbase to equip them for all terrain activity so that they could actually then explore what they were doing. Let's see if this video, this video plays a little bit. What they were actually doing is we gave them a new brain too, a bit of brain surgery. They followed concentration gradients of the environmental toxins we equipped them to sense, right? Uh, in most cases, uh, we did 11 releases around the country. These were volatile organic compounds, the most common urban pollutant. And um, what was interesting about this is the transformation of these robotic platforms from interactive toys, where in this case, these 15-year-olds who hadn't done programming or engineering, who does? And, in, in high school, um, certainly here in the Bronx, they, um, they didn't. They, um, when they released these packs on these brownfields and Starlight Park, they were actually in conversation. They were on every single 
talk show, local talk show, right? The journalists were asking them, what did your dogs find? What does it mean? What do we do about it? Because they had generated the evidence, they transformed these uh, robotic platforms from toys of interaction into tools for participation, for reimagining and redesigning their relationship to their local system. And that's what I think technology is really good for, right? We think of, start thinking of these drones as, as our ambassadors, as our ways of, um, of understanding, uh, you know, uh, of being present. Um, we can start thinking about what do we really want to communicate. So I'm going to give one other quick example. Um, this is black carbon. Um, uh, again, what are drones good for? Uh, this is a project called Drawing in Air that I've been doing for a while. Um, uh, it's actually just about producing pencils um, from what um, you, you might all know, the, this problem of black carbon or ultrafine particulate matter. The good news about black carbon, well, there's not a lot of good news about it, but it's, you know, it's one of the forcing functions. It's actually probably a quarter to a half of the climate change phenomenon that we're seeing now is from this black carbon, particulate matter from diesel and from combustion. Good news is it's, in, it's inefficient combustion, not from combustion itself. But it changes the reflectance of the atmosphere, right? It changes the color of snow and the reflectance of snow, drives that. It uh, lodges in our, in our pretty pink lungs. It circulates. It's associated with the asthma epidemic, with cardiovascular health, with Alzheimer's, and the, all sorts of bad things. And, uh, and actually, the other interesting thing about it is that East uh, and South Asia produce about half of it, and the developed world produces about half of it as well. Um, so a simple thing that we can do um, is actually put up these inexpensive plastic skins on, um, on uh, buildings. Uh, here's a very, very early prototype we did um, with some child labor. It turns out um, it's very cheap. Um, you put a plastic up. Hot, it heats up, right? Hot air rises, that forces it through a uh, filter and collects this ultrafine um, uh, material. Uh, we can actually do this very simply. What we do actually now is use electrostatic plates. We get about 99% efficiency of, of pulling that black carbon out of the air. And then we um, bind it with a clay and a wax and produce pencils, the length of which measures the amount of grime that you passively and inexpensively pulled out of the air, right? So that pencil production facility um, can, you know, if we all produced, use the vertical spaces that we've created, um, we can actually inexpensively um, do that. I, and one other quick area of, of, that we need to populate, and uh, I would actually also quote the graduate, um, uh, the technology of the 21st century, I would say, is not plastics. The technology of the 21st century is wetlands, albeit wet and slimy, muddy. Wetlands is the most critical ecosystem for sequestering carbon, for protecting the aquatic ecosystem, for protecting the terrestrial ecosystem. It's, it's you know, a nursery for the marine organisms. It, it reduces the, um, the loss of nutrients for agricul um, from agricultural land. And so re rethinking how we produce wetlands is something that we can do um, very easily. And I've uh, built a couple of wetlands myself. They're very good for landing um, amphibious planes in. You never have to level a uh, wet landing as opposed to a terrestrial landing. They cost about a tenth of the amount to produce. Um, and what I've done is actually um, string up uh, zip lines to allow you to fly over these wetlands and practice your wet landings on these um, wings, which really should be inflated structures um, that people have used. I've actually flown hundreds of people across um, through downtown Toronto um, to explore what inexpensive emissionless um, transportation might look like. Um, and of course, the hardest thing about doing these zip lines is getting that initial line up for which you need an uh, UAV. Um, so uh, I just wanted to kind of finish with this idea that um, what we really need for drones, the war tech of our time, is kind of an, an app store 
or maybe even a first robotics league, I would call the second robotics league, right? Um, always being first. I think let's talk about what comes second. Um, I want to be able to order Pakistani food, right? By a drone. You've heard about the taco copter. Um, uh, I want to be able to establish trade. I want to um, produce pencils in Afghanistan with black carbon and be able to have them here, right? I want, uh, I want an app store that can think about the space of, um, you know, do no evil uh, sounds a lot to me like the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. And the Hippocratic Oath was actually a very, very bad translation of what the Hippocratic Oath is. It's actually, while doing good, do no harm, right? If you translate it properly. And I think that it might be too obvious to say, but our drones could be uh, programmed to do some good. And I think if we figure out what we can do with them, um, potentially even addressing some of the major shared problems, like the uh, forcing function of black carbon on our global climate. Black carbon doesn't respect uh, national boundaries. It is transboundary. If we can collectively address some of our shared problems, I think that's a really great start to using our tech to help produce a desirable and peaceful future. Thank you very much. Thank you.